Hello there, Zach Stein. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you, John. You too. John, it's been a while. It's been a while. How are things in Vermont there? Good fall is setting in. The leaves have fallen off the trees, <laughs> but there's no snow yet. So this is the... Uh, and a long winter ahead, right? Or A long winter ahead. That's correct. Although it's unseasonably warm today, so we'll see. But there's and snow on the mountains. Beautiful when it's white there, I guess. Beautiful when it's white. This is called twig season. Huh. Uh, which is the time when there's no snow between fall and winter. And then there's mud season, which is the time when there's no snow between winter and spring. <laughs> okay, okay. Twig season, then 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 like the snow and then mud season. And then season. mud season and then spring and summer. <laughs> huh. So we are here to talk about something that you wrote now approximately a year ago, I guess, in the first instance. Um, and it's a, a book chapter in this book. Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds. Let's see your matching copy. Excellent. Um, and um, it's chapter, um, the title is called Disarm the Pedagogical Weaponry, Make Education Not Culture War. I guess I want to start by asking you about the title um, because it's evocative and that might be the best way into the overall thesis of what you argue and then we can focus a bit more on the details. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the idea occurred when, and I tell the story in the chapter where I'm at the airport and I'm watching these kids holding a tablet, watching YouTube on a tablet. <clears throat> and I happened to be reading this book, The New Dark Age uh, by Bridell, um, which is all about how YouTube specifically is harvesting the behaviors of children to micro target them and addict them to watching YouTube to then therefore sell advertisements on on YouTube. And so I realized this seemingly benign behavior of just distracting your kid with a pad, you know, to watch YouTube uh, was actually kind of putting the child in the context of this process of extraction and profit. Mm -hmm. And with the micro targeting, uh, essentially a attention capture model. Um, and so I, I it was kind of a little dystopian revelation at the at the airport <laughs> you know um and i thought my my goodness there's so much that's good on youtube first of all like actual educational material this uh, might be YouTube, of course yeah precisely right and so uh and yet within this space where education is supposed to be taking place there's predatory warlike behavior of basically colonizing your attention and extracting uh, your behavioral surplus, um, if, if you will. Uh, and so that, I started to realize that um, in that, basically the control over the means of cultural production and the control over the means of education uh, combined with the, the politicization of much of the content that's being looked at, uh, I started to realize we were in a situation of what I call in the, the essay, something like a, a totalized culture war. Right. And uh, as opposed to a, a, like a good old culture war <laughs> where it's limited in extent uh, and it is population centric, but reaching a small percentage of the population um, because the nature of the communications technologies were such that only so much of your attention could be dedicated to the political content. Um, so the kind of threshold was crossed. Uh, I don't know exactly when, certainly by 2016, you know, which is the place I cite in the paper, uh, where the, the depth and intensity of manipulative communication uh, overwhelmed uh, good faith communication in the interest of mutual understanding, right? Um, so that, that now when you move through the cultural space, you're more likely to encounter manipulative conversation than you are to encounter sincere conversation. Uh, and if that's the case, we're going to have a crisis of socialization. Um, children will not, uh, children will not be able to uh, basically be in relationships of education. They will be in relationships of coercion and manipulation. Okay. Um, and so that, that's the basic thesis that <clears throat> we have to watch out. We're crossing a threshold into something like a total culture war. And while the adults might think that's fine for some reason, because they've got political access to grind or profit to make, uh, they don't realize that 
they're messing with a basic resource that children need, which is culture, which is education, right. to such an extent that children won't be able to be socialized in a, in a healthy manner. They'll basically be turned into warriors uh, and turned into um, frontiers uh, for extraction. Okay. So lots of things come to mind there. The first is that you you made a point about the threshold, which implied a kind of um, tipping point of sorts in which the the encounter with culture shifted from being a default educational experience to being a default manipulative one. So there's a kind of empirical claim there, which yeah. may or may not have data for, we'll come back to that. Um, in terms of the title, the injunction to, to disarm the pedagogical weaponry is your way of saying there is a kind of war footing underway in the in this field of cultural production and by that you principally are referring to the cultural production of i'm assuming major tech platforms mm -hmm. um, and the algorithmic processes they use to extract and harvest data and there and thereafter to target and manipulate and coerce um, and you then you say make education not culture war now it's funny of course because i'm assuming you're alluding to make love not war as a kind of you know poetic reference um i suppose that you, quite early on in the piece it becomes clear that you're using education and culture not quite synonymously but close so tell me a little bit about the relationship between education and culture in what ways are the same and what ways you see them as different as being different yeah <clears throat> and that's a great place to start because we're so deep into the information warfare that we sometimes forget <laughs> what actual legitimate educational relationships look like. Right. Um, uh, and I'll get to the data, like you said, about the ubiquity of information warfare. Some of that work was done uh, later with the Consilience Project, so we can speak to that. Uh, so, but I, I define education very, very broadly, kind of like a, I'm a Deweyan in that sense, where, um, and I define it, of course, explicitly in, in both my books. It's uh, one way to think about it is as, uh, social autopoiesis, right? right? Um, that's a complex way of saying that it's the okay. way- Explain, I have some sense of yeah. what you- but... Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a way that a society does the work of reproducing itself. <laughs> like, uh, and it's a term from dynamical systems theory and, and, and systems biology, uh, where basically you see that a lot of what an organism is doing, like what I'm doing is I eat breakfast and my metabolism is working to maintain myself I'm, I'm, there's a lot of work it takes to continue right. to be zach <laughs> and so it's right. a kind of breakfast by that on that analogy not, yeah not well it's the, the metabolism, metabolism of the metabolism. society like you yeah you need to replenish just like i'm replenishing my cells and nutrients you need to replenish the capacities and skills that make a society possible and so to replenish those capacities and skills you have intergenerational transmission so so I speak a lot about that term intergenerational transmission because it's the essence of what uh, is distinct from uh, humans from animals. I would argue it's a species, species specific trait is the depth and intensity of our intergenerational transmission, which allows us to do this building up of civilization essentially. Okay. So in that sense, education is not schooling uh, and it's not reading and publishing and it's not television and media it's all of that stuff <laughs> and it even goes beyond that into the default curriculums implied by our basic institutions so we're taught how to think about equality by the tax codes whether we like it or not <laughs> right we're taught about the value of people by the way our society treats homeless people for example whether we like it or not so many of the social patterns and ubiquitous norms and interactions are also educational or educative um, and so that's education in that it's always about the younger generation eventually replacing the older generation <laughs> uh, and so in that context culture is kind of like the currency of education culture is the stuff that allows education to take place it's the symbols and images and languages and artifacts and architectures um, that allow for society to do the work of reproducing itself and ultimately evolving itself um, and so in that sense when culture becomes dangerous <laughs> uh insincere bad faith weaponized uh profit center yeah. <laughs> um, then the very currency with 
which we're using to do legitimate teacherly authority, to do intergenerational transmission, to have society keep on going, that we, you know, we don't have the stuff we need. Because what we need is good faith communication. And the, and the play on love and war is intentional because the argument I take following you know, many educational theorists is that the relationship of student and teacher uh, or parent and child or elder and youth um, is one that needs to be grounded in the love of mutual respect. Um, that's what stops coercive and manipulative behavior. So you step into a culture where there's no love, <laughs> uh, what's the result in terms of intergenerational transmission? Right. So that's kind of like very broadly how I hold education. It's relatively recently that we formalized, like relatively recently that we formalized uh, education into schooling. And so many people collapse education at schooling. And so we have to kind of disentangle that and then see that <clears throat> therefore, if you look more broadly, digital media, social media in particular, is one of the most like let's just say crazy things to happen in education in a long time. That doesn't mean in schools. <laughs> it means in a societal process of intergenerational transmission and societal autopoiesis, throwing social media into that is yeah, yeah. remarkable, at least as remarkable as the printing press, <laughs> uh, but, but more so, right? Um, and so in that context, we run the risk of, and I think I use the phrase in the essay, a catastrophic disruption of intergenerational transmission. Yes. And that's an existential risk, basically. And it's interesting because you also compare it to the splitting of the atom in the sense mm -hmm. that you can't unsplit the atom. We now live with this threat of nuclear annihilation. And you're drawing an analogy there with the impact of social media on this pattern of cultural reproduction and intergenerational yeah. transmission. Um, hold that thought, because I want to ask you something before I forget it, which is that just this distinction between, just to really clarify, learning, schooling, and education um, certainly overlaps. I know that there will be, you know, interrelationships and so forth, but just to clarify how you see it, um, am I right in thinking that you would say schooling is best understood as primarily institutional in nature, uh, for good and bad, that learning is is well it's not just cognitive right but it's it's something to do with the the organism and the environment there's something about learning that's distinct from the, the broader pattern of intergenerational transmission mm -hmm. i just want to get clear about those three terms yeah, that's, so that that's a great set that. yeah learning is actually the the, the primordial category there right. because learning goes way deep right. in into biological and yeah it's and it's what we do right it's the, um and so whereas it's clear that mammals learn really well um, by my definition of education we can get really specific here mm -hmm. and look at tomasello's research uh monkeys don't have education right uh, but they have lots of learning like they have lots of learning and there's lots of interaction between older and younger monkeys right. but the intensity of the joint attentional situation and the thematization of the educational relationship held by both parties <laughs> which is right. to say you know you're a student and I know I'm a teacher, we both know we're in a learning context. Um, that complexity of joint attention doesn't occur in the animal kingdom, but learning does. <laughs> and likewise, in humans, you can do a ton of learning um, uh, that isn't technically like in the context of an educational relationship. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of learning is behaviorist in nature, right? I mean, when you describe right. the animals, and some of it is more, how would you describe it, constructive? constructionistic or how it, what would yes. well i mean i i and i speak to this in my dialogues with verveke and uh greg enriquez um that there's a there's like lower uh and lower is not even the right word more basic embodied forms of learning that have to do with organism reality interactions yeah, yeah. Uh, and then piaget talks about the emergence of the semiotic function okay when that emerges <laughs> then you're learning with and through language and then you're already suffused in education so there's a place where learning the semiotic function is partly where learning becomes education i guess it's, and like becomes in, intrinsically linked but so like for example i taught myself to play the bass like and i didn't learn sheet music i just experimented with the physics of the bass until i got really good at it right. 
there was some education in there because I was listening to other bass players and stuff, but it was really me, just me like solipsistically with the bass and my muscle memory and just like, and that's more just like learning. That's still a little bit of education, but much of what humans, that's the rare instance in humans, most what we call learning in humans, right. in and through language, in and through relationship, um, and therefore bound up in this educational process, uh, which is broader than schooling. So it's like we had learning and then education emerges. And then within education, we get this thing schooling, which again is a is not a it's not a mistake. Like it's yeah. a very important innovation. It's basically remember what I said about the Tomasello joint attentional situation. It's we both know we're in an educational relationship. So it's already thematized, going way, way back, right. the teacher-student thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's inevitable that, that becomes somehow put as an institution. Um, right. And so we get schools very early in civilization and we don't know how early, um, probably earlier than we think if you take David Graeber's new work right. <laughs> seriously. Right. Um, so not saying that like schools are distinctly modern or anything like that, but I am saying that they're a subclass of education right. and education is a subclass of learning, <laughs> okay. uh, something like that. Okay, yeah. got it. And, and of course it's an endless conversation. Those three terms yeah. are also rich. Um, just in passing it, I, I was wondering what de-schooling society by Illich means in that context. You can choose whether to answer that or not. That might just be too much out of the picture. Sure. That's the whole thing. I mean, I, that's kind of like, I would kind of say like read the first couple of chapters of my book where I thematize Illich uh, because it's, you know, it, what's interesting is that what he talks about as de-schooling, a better way to talk about it is actually thinking about turning the whole city into a school. Okay. okay. Right. Like it's, so that's, it's subtle, but it's important that he's actually, he's not talking about not institutionalizing education. He's saying radically changing the way it's institutionalized such that it's completely distributed. Okay. So that everyone's a potential educational resource. So it's like the, every, be the, best school, like the best school is not a school at some level. It, exactly that, but it is institutional. And so my educational hub network, which I talk about is very much inspired by Illich. And I'm, I'm saying it's it's an evolution of schooling mm -hmm. that basically, I, and one of my titles is like, uh, schools are dead long live schools, <laughs> you know, which is to say like, yeah, that form of institutionalizing education, which we call quote unquote schooling, modern schooling, that's passing away, but some new, much more sophisticated institution, yeah. which would be weird to call a school, but we may end up calling them schools, okay. is going to emerge. And okay. yeah, so yeah, Illich turned the whole city into a school. Um, he didn't do away with schools. He did away with stupid factory schools <laughs> that limit education to a specific place and time and type of relationship right. and type of assessment and type of content. Uh, and then kids hate schooling and then they think they hate learning and education when really they just hate school. <laughs> okay. And if you could get them into a good educational environment, they would love learning. Um, so, well, of course, so la last question on definitions, um, because of course, you hear about tacit learning and informal learning uh, and then formal learning, which would be often associated with schools. And um, you seem to be saying that tacit, formal and informal learning um, are all cultural and in that sense, all for you educational. <clears throat> and so I'm just trying to clarify when you say when you speak of culture as education, you're referring to all of the, you know, you mentioned that you learn how equality through the tax code, for example, that there are these, the education is sort of radically distributed, embedded in every aspect of culture and society. It's just that we don't think of it as education because for various historical reasons, we associate education with schooling, which is a very limited conception of it. And not just because the learning is limited, but because the, the idea of society is somehow wrong and the idea of cultural reproduction and intergenerational transmission is not adequately captured by that. Um, so where I'm, what I'm getting at is what I, I want you to really clarify for us, because it's right at the heart of the chapter, you know, the tech giants and the culture war, to see that through an educational lens, I totally see why a Julian philosopher of education gets that. But for those watching this for the first time, for whom these terms are maybe a little bit new and take some at getting their heads around, what, what are you actually saying? I mean, is, 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 is culture war and educational war the same thing? And if not, why not? 
So by my definition, you wouldn't have educational war. <clears throat> you know, you'd have- For you, that's an oxymoron maybe. It'd be an oxymoron. Right. If, you're, if you're doing education, then you're in the situation of intergenerational transmission that- Which is uh, always good, or just to be clear, is education inherently good for you? It's, it's, uh, it's inherently done in good faith right. between the parties. Okay. Um, now, if one of the older party, the, the teacher, the authority, uh, is themselves confused, <laughs> yeah. they can in good faith mislead. Okay. Um, but if the student's acting in good faith and the relationship is reciprocal enough, if the student receives and perceives error, they can then help the teacher. And so it, it's a, there's an idealization here, almost like a Habermasian idealization yeah, yeah, I do, of, yeah, I see that. of a legitimate form of teacherly authority, um, which I think is a species specific trait. And it's like our saving grace, basically. Right. If we can create cultural contexts where those forms of teacherly authority can emerge, they're self-correcting in relationship to uh, reality, including more ethical reality. Um, Got it. So when you say uh, the, sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, please. Well, just that when you say in the title, make education, I'm beginning to get a feeling for what you mean now, because you're, it's, it might be true that a tribal elder could pass on to a, a, a sort of someone recent, someone quite young, a pattern of behavior that might be thoroughly misogynistic or seem to be by Western liberal standards somehow wrong. Um, but he be, if he was passing it on in good faith, you might say that it's sort of it's still education in the sense that he, there's a sense in which the culture is trying to reproduce itself with the best available knowledge that it has. It doesn't mean it's always right, but what makes it education and not propaganda or not coercion is that it's done with a view to educate and actually right. allow the society to survive and flourish. Right. It's, it's coming from that place of intention. That's what makes it education. Yes. So you imagine, you imagine the young person coming into the culture and saying, having a need, right? And the need is to be educated. I don't know how the world works. I don't know how the adults, how do the adults think? Right. And they come in and they're basically, you know, you've captured the market of their attention. They need to learn. <laughs> they have to come into the space. Right. So if they're met by elders who in good faith try to tell them what they need to know to learn, then it's educational. Now that doesn't mean that it's necessarily we would agree with what's being taught, but the situation is one of earnestly trying to, like you say, reproduce the values of the society through good faith, teacherly dynamics. You know, but the, the issue is that in our context now that youth comes into the culture and there are technologists who say, awesome, <laughs> but I'm actually gonna it. make a ton of profit yeah. uh, off of your need. Right. And I'm actually gonna make that profit by algorithmically augmenting your human development through attention capture technologies in such a way that the sequence of videos that you see on YouTube isn't optimized for your education. It's not optimized to meet that need, although that need is what's being <laughs> ultimately preyed upon. Yes. It's optimized to keep you looking. And then, so then we're into the Tristan Harris race to the bottom of the brainstem. Right. You're captured algorithmic radicalization, right. algorithmic augmentation of identity formation, yeah. those things all based upon kind of like parasitically preying upon the, the, the inescapable need of the youth coming into the culture needing to learn about what the adults have to say. Okay. Right? And, right. and so, so again, yeah, the tribal elder, if he is not manipulating that kid, if he is earnestly saying, listen, this is what my dad taught me. This is my only experience that I've had. I, there's probably problems with it, but this is the best of our knowledge, kid. Like right. in earnest, what do you think? <laughs> Tell so, me. Right, so I've, I've got it, what it means to say to make education. Um, uh, and by the way, the reason I'm sticking on this title is that as you know, we had this little disagreement about a year ago where I was like, are you sure about this title? You know? And you were like, no, trust me, this is the title. And I just said, okay, if Zach says that, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but just to, I'm now getting, it's now becoming a bit clearer to me because what you're saying is, I understand what it means to make education in the sense of where it's coming from, what its intentionality is. It's about social autopoiesis, it's about intergenerational transmission, it's about cultural perpetuation and evolution. That's where education is. To make culture war is something altogether different. It doesn't really give a damn whether the culture lives or dies, whether the person learns what they need to learn, whether their needs are actually met or just exploited. To make culture war is to exploit 
the legitimate need of an organism to learn. Exactly. But not for the greater good, but for the extractive profit. Exactly. Sort of right. So just, just to stay on that, because mm -hmm. then you say disarm the pedagogical weaponry. That's where it gets into the question of what you mean by pedagogical weaponry is this sudden influx of social media and all that that means algorithmically in terms of power and asymmetry and so forth. Mm -hmm. You're saying that is the new pedagogical weaponry. It's like it's as if there's a new nuclear bomb right mm -hmm. in the heart of our culture. And you're saying we have to disarm that fast or the whole educational process will be busted. Exactly. Okay, now I understand your chapter. Right, got yeah. it. <laughs> I thought I did before, but now I really do. So, okay, good. So, so, so tell me more about um, particularly the, the prevalence of culture war and why you feel, because I think the next thing I would say, the next potential critique, once the conceptual clarifications are done, is something about really zach are you sure you're not overstating this you know are you sure you're not a bit of a doomsdayer is it really that bad can you can persuade me that it actually is that bad mm -hmm. yeah so like i said some of the work this chapter led me into an exploration of the state of information warfare and so i've been working closely uh you know with some others at the consilience project so there's some papers out there on this that deepen this argument i think in essence um right. the first one being uh, it's a mad information war right. and mad standing for mutually assured destruction and so it's in that paper that i lay out the kind of dark history and unknown history of information warfare uh specifically as it met digital technology right. about a decade ago uh, birthing a new field uh, of research on, as computational propaganda. Um, and basically the, the situation is such that um, it's hard to, I think, overstate <laughs> uh, just how much we've become accustomed to ubiquitous, manipulative right. informational environments, right? Um, and then some of that is because of advertising, but some of that is also because of the emergence of social media as a like 24 seven live with you information source, yeah. um, which is unprecedented um, from a standpoint. So if you look at the history of propaganda research, it's, it's clear from Pavlov on <laughs> that we were looking for technologies that would allow us to um, much more easily predict people's behavior after they engage with them right. right um and television was only so good you couldn't get reinforcement scheduling with television mm -hmm. uh and the television wasn't watching you right it, it wasn't monitoring your behavior to figure out what you liked to give you something you liked to keep you watching it mm -hmm. or to give you something you hate to make you angry and then tell you to go to the street Right. Uh, but social media does it that it watches you more than you watch it, which is to say it's watching you when you're not on the website. It's watching just to be where clear, though, just again, just to put a word in for the devil's advocate here. I get that they're watching you and I get that it's uh, profoundly powerful and, it, and that it's target and that it, it's using data followed by psychographic profiling with enormous scientific power to directly coerce you for their ends that are not your own ends, to meet your apparent needs that are actually mostly constructed by them for their purposes and not yours. I do understand the, the logic of it, I think. I suppose I just want to question, and partly with images from the Social Dilemma documentary in my mind, there aren't those three people in the room like talking among themselves about how to get you. What there is is something al entirely algorithmic based on your prior data and the preferences that are created through that and AI working to optimize that for the company's sake. I guess I just don't know how bad that is. And I, I suppose I want persuading that the nature of that vehicle is profoundly powerful and coercive and not merely a kind of slightly floundering thing that occasionally gets it right and occasionally doesn't. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to think through. So there's, but there's at least two angles. There's the, the algorithmic angle, which you speak to, which is the asymmetric computational power of them watching your behavior as opposed to you watching their behavior. So imagine a child holding the iPad, <clears throat> imagine the power of that child's brain, and then imagine the 
power of the AI algorithm. <laughs> that it's is interesting modern. you say that though, Zach, because that's precisely what that question is getting at. Mm -hmm. There is an asymmetry, but it's also it's a qualitative asymmetry, not a quantitative one, right? Mm -hmm. right. That child is a you know complex adaptive system. It's a growing organism. It has support structures. It can turn the computer off, the iPad off. Um, it will go and get analog learning from brothers and sisters. Right. Am I being naive here? Is it is it wrong to think? That well, no. So that so there's just but there were two parts. So there's the algorithm. Right. So there's that asymmetry of learning about you, and then figuring out kind of where you're at and what to give you next. But then there's actual content, and this is where I think it starts to does start to become a little naive to think that this stuff isn't as powerful as it actually is. TikTok's the greatest example. Mm, it's, it's it's a nightmare. Like, and so literally it's actually a nightmare. If you yeah. think about the structure of imagery and the flow of imagery and the incoherence and kind of like pastiche uh, of the image scape. And so, and the design, so there's like, if you look at the neuroscience done on film, right. for example, uh, it's very clear that uh, although reflective people know they're watching a movie, the brain's like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> and then when you remember afterwards, it's a lot of evidence to show that people mix actual memories with memories from things they've seen on screens. Uh, and then the intensity of limbic activation from screen engagement, right? So now you have this sense, and then if you even go even weirder, you look at the work that was done after World War II on screen-based uh, indoctrination and brainwashing techniques. This was brought out by Kubrick yep. uh, in uh, Clockwork Orange, right? Yeah, right. Like this. Yeah, yeah. Thing. Like, so advertisers learned a lot from that. Um, and so now you're looking at not just the algorithm's ability to put something in front of you, but the thing they put in front of you itself is designed <laughs> to right. be maximally uh, attention capturing and also maximally image Im image implanting if you will okay uh, and because you, because and what's the motivation guess, for making it that way the motivation is making that way is because they're they're trying to manipulate your behavior they're advertisers right. um, or yeah. they're, yeah. but i mean the, the, they've figured out that this is the way to do it basically totally yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean uh, some of our the greatest minds of my generations went in the greatest creative minds of my generation went into advertising. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and PR campaigns and things of that nature. Uh, and again, on Facebook and some of these things, sometimes you don't even know that what you're watching was made by an advertising mm. company. Mm. Um, so there's the getting in front of you something particular, and then that thing has its own power. Yeah. Uh, and then there's also the like I said, as we've seen with the neuroscience of film, there's the hypnotic or hypnagogic mm -hmm. kind of state inducing trance like thing that happens mm -hmm. from the infinite scroll. Right. <laughs> and if you look at user data, like there's a lot of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that sense of, again, when you're looking at ways to manipulate people and you look at how things like uh, forced confessions and brainwashings work. Um, there's a lot of parallels to the types of states that are induced by overuse of social media. Right? Because there's two, two things here that are interesting immediately on that point. The first is, it reminds me of your work on metapsychology, which I know you've spoken about online. We're still waiting for it to be published in text, which is not a, not a conversation, but um, there you speak about ensoulment vis-a-vis -vis images. And there's quite a strong argument about linking the quality and health of our soul. And you can maybe help us with what that means, but most of us have an intuitive sense of it um, with imagery as such. And that therefore there is a sense in which this auto scrolling principally driven by images is a direct attack on the soul and an attempt to sort of colonize it in a certain way. Yeah. Well, it, it, it captures your personality yeah. and populates your identity reflections with exogenous images that are not yours and disconnected, discoherent, you know, not uh, kind of symbolically and archetypally well saturated, which is to say, like, you know, kids are kids are given their ideals of their selves by advertising companies and entertainment. Yeah. Um, uh, kids used to be given their <laughs> identity of self from, let's say, religion or family history. 
the language of endogenous and exogenous is really interesting for me here because mm -hmm. when you said exogenous images that are not their own, I suddenly began to feel, aha, uh -huh, this is part of the issue. There's somehow the organism embedded in its environment has its own pattern of learning and expectations of learning. And the images they're used to would normally arise in some sense naturally out of that environment, whether it's the church tower or the park nearby. Or... And, and it's not that we didn't used to do this. I right. mean, Hillman, who a lot of James Hillman, who a lot of this work comes from, he makes a big point about the, the outlawing of imagery <laughs> by many religions, right? Because mm -hmm. the power of imagery. But we used to be exposed to imagery. It would be so powerful, but it would be limited in duration. Right. And it would be coherent in presentation. So right. like, and advertising was this way up until fairly recently. You drive to work, you see maybe 10 or 15 billboards, right? Okay. Now you on the train to work, looking at your phone, you could see a hundred TikTok videos, each of them with two dozen different information bits due to the slicing of the video, right? And so those, and those who say, look, that's just evanescent. It passes away. I don't pick up any of it. You're saying wrong. On the contrary. I'm saying wrong. You're precisely in a trance state. Right. You're, <laughs> getting, trans -state. you're being colonized. Yeah, you're, you're getting... You're getting your identity populated with images that are not your own with by people who are intending to manipulate you. Even if the only manipulation is to keep you in a trance state looking so they can they, sell they, so, so interesting, just imagine again, the, the chess player in me always wants to see it from the opponent's point of view. You're saying they're trying to manipulate you. They say, well, it's not so much I want to manipulate them. <laughs> they say something like, I, mm -hmm. I just want them to um, buy, the, buy, you know, buy the product, but that doesn't really work here, right? Because the product is not the same as it used to be. Somehow here, the product is your continual attention for potential advertising revenue. Yeah. Um, so the product is the eyeball scrolling that's being captured and then sold at some level. Behavioral surplus, you use that term. This is a Zuboff yeah. term, I think, right? Yeah, that's, that's Zuboff's term. Yeah, yeah. For, for Facebook, you are the product. Right. Your attention and the curation of your attention, the focus of your attention is product. But we know that meet social media targeted uh, type advertising and intervention causes people to take behaviors away from social media, like going to the street and protesting, for example, or voting in a particular way or getting a biomedical procedure or not. So when I say they're trying to manipulate you, the social media company is trying to keep your attention held. Right. People using the social media company and the social media company says, hey, we'll we'll put anything you want in front of anybody's well, that's, eyes. That's interesting, right? So there's a two-part process. So the social media company's job is to make the product as 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 profitable as possible potentially and then the advertiser then chooses what to do with that available pro that that product that they're ineffectively they're effectively what are they doing are they buying it or they're um they're renting it out in some way like they're renting the brainwashing right? machine right <laughs> <laughs> like and that's, it sounds that's, that might be the title for this video Rent it sounds video. hyperbolic but they're basically saying hey we figured out a way to keep people staring at the screen get them in a hypnagogic statement and make them susceptible su to suggestion you want some of this yeah do you want do you want to have your thing put there basically right. um you can pay us a little bit and we'll give you more information about these people than they know about themselves right. uh and we will assure you that they will basically and stay focused why it's so yeah. Yeah. So and then the idea, like, and we'll do that to kids. Right. So here's the thing. I'm glad you came to that because that's the, I want to, I want to get back to what it means to try and disarm. But before that, just tell me a little bit more about the impact of children specifically. Right. Because you seem to be implying in the chapter that we have a catastrophic failure of intergenerational transmission on our hands and we haven't even realized it yet. It's like a yeah. ticking bomb of sorts. Yeah. Um, I mean, so if you think about, what Facebook does, and even YouTube, and some of the Google suite, uh, if you use the term uh, child surveillance uh, and child coercion, <laughs> uh, then it just becomes very clear that we're, we're not doing our job protecting children okay. from the predatory behavior of technologists. It's just very simple. Like, um, And so at the minimum, what we should do is not allow people under 18 to be subject to micro targeted advertisements or to be subject to the extraction of behavioral right. surplus. Um, Cause like I said, that's surveilling and coercing right. children. Um, uh, and 
but we're also surveilling and coercing adults too, but like that's not- and the reason, and, and I can say as a parent, sadly, that one of the reasons that parents are not working harder to get their kids off the devices is that that gives them an excuse to be on their devices. Yes. You know, that, and that's um, yeah. a terrible indictment of yeah. where we are, but it does, it, they're, they're so addictive for both parents and children. Um, and then the idea being that, the, you know, for example, I, you know, born in 1980, remember a time without the internet back in the day i was there i was there yeah our phones and so i you know when i engage with social media i can't imagine what it was like to never not know it it's not the best way to say that but to no, always I know what have you mean. it i know what you mean to always have it and so i think there's also something about the youth in particular not having the like space or even the right to be off to yeah. be not in to be not surveilled and not coerced the, the, like they're just basically so, put in us in this in this system uh so that's just so again no, it's very interesting you say that Zach, because just as a as a kind of opportunistic aside but you know this is a, an analog book that we produced and I, I had a lovely conversation with adam roberts of the side view about why bother producing analog content at all like why not just put it online and i compared it to um Diet Coke in the sense that Coke was valuable and then Diet Coke came along and it was valuable because it was the same good thing but without the sugar. Right. In the same way what a book is, it's freedom from hypertext, right? right. A book yeah. is partly the freedom not to be distracted and pulled away from what you're actually focused yeah. on. Well, and a lot of research shows that you retain more reading from actual physical books than you do on screens. Like yeah. That's very clear. So yeah, so I concern I, my worries about the kids because of the fragility of identity formation, the novelty of social media as an identity formation environment, right. um, and then the so idea that, that so that, it's such a powerful thing to say. Social media as an identity formation environment It's kind of obvious, but I never heard it put quite. I mean, it's not. And, and I never heard it put quite that quickly. way. Then you realize it's like, oh, you, the, my kid is in a socialization environment that is actually built on <laughs> the idea of surveillance and. Okay, so, so again, devil's advocate question. It was always thus at some level, right? Okay, nothing like the level of it. I get it. The, the, the scale of it is not, not in doubt. But you and I growing up, there were billboards, there were TV ads, there were people trying to tell us you should be like this person. Um, and identity formation happened partly through, you know, reading magazines. I want to be like that rock star or that chess player or whatever. Um, you're saying this is different though, and it's not just a quantitative matter, right? Or is it? I mean, it's, it's both, it's a both quantity turning into a new type of quality and a new type of quality. You know, I mean, right. we were exposed to advertising, but you could only, you know, there was only so much on TV. Yeah. And sometimes TV wasn't even available. And, and this is where your threshold empirical point matters. Yeah. Exactly. Because I want to understand you're not speaking of like something that goes from 49% to 51% and then back again. You're speaking of something that by going into that terrain of being the majority experience, mm -hmm. whereby you're coerced more than you're educated, manipulated more than you're educated, that somehow that has an underlying dynamic of self-perpetuation that gets worse and worse and worse. Right. So if you imagine that there's always been some subset of people trying to weaponize communication technology, I mean, back to like Ramsey's the first, right? <laughs> like propaganda has always existed, right? And then you imagine... Uh, the printing press, right? That's like a, a rifle, but does the rifle you have to like put the thing in like the revolutionary war rifle, right? Then you get radio, right. television. If you think of those as weapons, now we're into tanks, maybe airplanes and stuff, right? right? My argument is that when we get to the digital, right. if we think of that as potentially weaponizable, now we're in the realm of the nuclear. We've right. gone to almost completely destructive population centric information warfare uh where there's no escape okay like so just to because be like when i was a kid it was a really powerful analogy right so when i was a kid you had to call around be like can we watch tv at your house no yeah, 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 yeah. can we watch and then but now literally we're studying what it's like to be away from the screen yeah. like setting up summer camps setting up cognitive science experiments to see what happens when kids are not on their screen right <laughs> right no, well, I mean, I, yeah i yeah. mean I'm a, I'm a parent, I observe the difference every day and it's striking. So that's the evolution. Now, the other side is that each of those printing can, can press... I hold you? Just hold that thought okay. because I really want to get, you said something really part profound that I want to hold on to. Because you're, as I heard you, it was as if you were saying 
that in the context of the analog world, the planet, there was a, an escalation of warfare from sticks and stones to Bronze Age technology, all the way to nuclear war and biological and chemical weapons. And you seem to be saying that in the, if you imagine the digital world as a kind of terrain, there's also been a kind of escalation. And we've now reached a point where in the informational context, you've got something in the form of social media that has a similar power to nuclear war in terms of one is potentially destroying buildings and infrastructure and people. And this one is destroying intergenerational transmission. Hmm. It's something like that you're saying, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so what I was saying is that, yeah, there's been this evolution of kinetic war, right? From sticks and, and arrows through simple, you know, bullets and right. then nuclear war. And at a certain point, when we reached biological and nuclear war for in particular, the Second World War, there was like, whoa, 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 like international attention. We need to change the rules of engagement, mutually right. assured destruction. We can't use these weapons, right. full stop. Can't use these weapons. Um, I'm saying that in information war, which has also always been a part of war, there's been a similar evolution as information technology has evolved. Yep. And that as you get to radio and television, you start to get some pretty serious weaponry. Right. When you cross a threshold into digital, then you get analogously to the atomic, uh, we should be in a whoa, 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 we can't use these weapons situation because okay. we can basically brainwash a whole population if we want to. <laughs> and it's maybe even worse because mutual issue destruction for all its craziness does have that capacity potential argument that the very fact that it's mutually destructive is what keeps it right exactly. say, we don't even have that now right yeah the, the idea that you can't win a culture war right that, that now we have such powerful information weapons that are so readily available to all sides oh, that is your point okay so That's you're actually I'm, so I, I i was making a different point but i can see now that you're arguing the opposite which is that it's in the, everyone's interest to perpetuate the culture war and keep it going and you can't win it because of the underlying mechanisms that make it what it is. No, I'm saying that everyone loses if we keep fighting the culture war. I know, but yeah. I think you're also, there's also a strong vested interest from those who, yes, the, the pedagogical weaponry that needs to be disarmed yes. is owned by very powerful people Correct. who want to have a situation in which the culture war isn't mm -hmm. won, yes. uh, but remains yeah. underway. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, so the analogy there with nuclear war is interesting I and mean, it's imperfect. And of course, like all yeah. analogies. Yeah. It's just the idea is that it's like, I'm trying to make clear that these, you know, these digital technologies are having an effect, mm. uh, and we're not noticing as much as we should, right. the potential dangers of these effects. And we're, and many of the adults, I believe are in the fog of the culture war themselves yeah. actually. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lack of care and attentiveness to the socialization environments that are emerging for mm. children. And the more disturbing thing that I've seen is like when you look at digital media literacy, where textbooks for middle schoolers and high schoolers, uh, which are intended to make them aware that they're kind of in a complex media environment where mm. they're being manipulated. Um, it's interesting work but it is itself <laughs> trying just to alert them to right-wing propaganda right. Right. and encouraging them to make left-wing propaganda and put it on Twitter, <laughs> right? And so it's like, uh, instead of saying, we need to de-escalate this entirely, they're basically saying like, hey kids, watch out for the right-wing propaganda. So it's an arms um, race. Uh, so it's an arms race and they're recruiting the kids instead of creating demilitarized zones for the kids to actually be educated within. Okay. Um, so they're, they're, they're literally giving kids weapons. <laughs> right. And I cite an example of that uh, in here um, with that YouTube star, that young, that yes, young so. girl um, uh, who is basically brilliantly repurposing uh, you know, linguistic and mimetic weaponry handed to her by the adults. <laughs> uh, and then cynically saying, well, this is what you gave me <laughs> to the adults saying, you know, you created me basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, so I think it's the main point with that analogy is just to say yeah, there's a we've crossed the threshold here, okay. and we need to be we need to be paying much more attention and start uh, educating children a lot more about what what is happening, like what right. the screens actually are. 
Like, yes. uh, and so. Okay, that, that, that's that's very. I mean, it's so rich. That, I mean, it's the kind of it's the cultural frontier of sorts. So it feels like there's too much to say at any given moment. But demilitarized zones intrigues me. Mm -hmm. um, because it suggests you can have some kind of it's not just that it's it's not so much that it's apolitical it's it's to do it's a space where no one's trying to change you for for how would you put it for ends that are not how would you distinguish between the ends that are valuable for the culture and the ends that are valuable for the corporations mm -hmm. you would say yeah. that because it's there's still a sense of motivation right it's not as though it's the education is still driven by a sense of wanting to change the children in a certain way. Mm -hmm. yep. But you're saying mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. not, it's not in a way that it's in a way that's concerned for their welfare in a way. Yeah. That it well, isn't. And it, it's an, the demilitarized zone allows for those legitimate forms of teacherly authority to emerge. Right. Um, whereas the culture war is characterized by illegitimate forms of asymmetry and manipulation. Um, and so, as I say in one of the conciliance papers, like propaganda is the evil twin of education. Yeah. Like it looks a lot like education. Right. And many people who believe they're educating, like these books of digital media literacy, they're actually <laughs> just doing a more sophisticated form of, of propaganda. So education is characterized by legitimate forms of teacherly authority where you are cooperating in the interest of the student right. in relation to reality. Uh, and that's a self-correcting process where the asymmetry of epistemics that allows for the relation of teacherly authority is intended to be made obsolete. So there's a very important. Yes, point. yes. One of the ways, point. one of the ways you can recognize propaganda uh, and kind of manipulative communication. This is true in cults and other mm -hmm. other places where there's overt uh, overt persuasion, persuasion and manipulation, is the, the putting in place some kind of barrier mm -hmm. of access between what the student or receiver could ever learn and what the person who's teaching right. knows so i call it an unbridgeable epistemic asymmetry right. mm -hmm. and so if that's in place and this is usually the case with in relation to our mainstream media outlets because mm -hmm. we like how are you supposed to get up and into these conversations you don't know <laughs> and they're not invited um so we're used to back basically not having full access to right. the information um but the, the real experience one has, I'm sure you've had it with your teachers, is that you're looking over their shoulder at the same text. Yeah. They are grappling with you about what it means yes. uh, yeah. and giving you the best of their knowledge and hoping that you supplant them in understanding it, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Whereas in a culture war situation, usually you're giving something like a thought terminating cliche, yes. which you're not intended to actually question uh, and then when you get deep in, you realize that the ideology doesn't have resolution <laughs> for some of the simplicities uh, characterized by the thought terminating cliches. And so you can start to recognize these environments where oh, it's ostensibly it claims to be education. But if you really look at what's happening, it's not earnest exploration right. of reality. Uh, Wait, so it's, a certain, it's, it's a certain so it's form of indoctrination. It's yeah. the second time you mentioned reality. I was glad to hear it the first time. Um, that's something, there's something about reality here, right? Fundamentally, <laughs> yes. ed ed education <laughs> is tethered to reality and, education and, tethered to reality. and wants to be. Mm -hmm. and, and so you could say it has a view of, I mean, to put it philosophically, the epistemology is not strategic. It's it's mm -hmm. grounded in a kind of, how would you put it? It's, it's grounded in a metaphysics or it's grounded in an ontology maybe? But yeah, there's a sense in which the epistemology, you know, is there independent of any motivation for it to be a certain way? Right. And if you think about it functionally, like a social autopoiesis, the idea is that the elders figured something out about reality that allowed them to stay alive. Right. Right. <laughs> and so, like, it's in their interest for you to figure it out as well or better than they did. Right. Now, there's going to be other stuff that's superstition. So, you know, civilizations always run on a certain amount of simulation. Yeah. So some of what's handed on will be, you know, not reality dependent, but even there it's often tied to ethical or social realities, which are just harder to see than the physical realities. But yeah, that's one of the stipulations of educational relationships is that they have at least some tether to reality that there's a third party between teacher and student, which is right. 
the world. Yeah. Right. So, um, and so you're cooperating to help the student reach and then surpass your understanding of some phenomenon that's real. And, and it's really vivid there because uh, you know, when you say the third, the third point of reference between the two that are in, a, in an educational relationship, when you think of the screen, there is someone watching the screen and someone behind it, but the screen itself is not real. It's a simulation of some kind, right? The screen right. itself, you know, is not neutral. It's um, unlike a tree or a, you know, yep. something that is grounded in, in a different kind of reality. Well, and it's if you think about thing, yeah. Yeah, if you think about someone trying to educate someone else through an asynchronous text exchange on social media, mm. what you have is like two people in a simulation arguing about the simulation, mm. basically. Because, mm. and this is where it gets Baudrillardian and very postmodern, where you're just stuck in this endless, yeah. endless simulation of circulating yeah. signifiers, all which reference one another, none of which necessarily reference the world mm. at all. The person you're talking to could be an AI bot. <laughs> right so it gets really weird and so we need to pull back from that and return education to i think frankly quite simple contexts um mm -hmm. because it's in simple contexts where you can actually experience legitimate teacherly authority one of the breakdowns of teacherly authority is because we're in the simulation right and so if your only experience of people who can teach you something <laughs> is in an environment where there's no opportunity to actually disprove or prove what they've told you, <laughs> then there's no way to actually trust or not trust their teacherly authority. But if you're in a situation with a teacher, let's say like in an outdoor education program and it starts to rain <laughs> and the teacher's like, Hey, I know how to make a shelter. Do you guys know how to make a shelter? And, and you know, phones, yeah. no internet, right. And then you're in a situation of, uh, okay all right, this is an actual teacher. I need to be a student here. Sure. Um, and obviously you can see how critiques of authority, critiques of teacherly authority, yeah, yeah. power dynamics is all there. But the truth is that sure. children and young adults and adults want to be oriented to reality with other people. Yeah. And some of the pain and psychological distress, which has escalated uh, during the pandemic almost exponentially, is a result of that feeling alienation from contact with reality and the inability to even be in a conversation with someone about a reality right, right. so like that's the frustration is that you we can't even have the conversation because yeah. we can't agree on what's real because we're all just arguing in a simulation and we can't escape it and actually put our hand on something that's yeah. definitively the right. case right um, and so that's a very disorienting environment for socialization which is pretty novel because right. uh, it used to be like hey adult how does the world work and the adult's like here's how it works now they might not be true right. now it's like hey adult how does the word work world work and the adult's like i don't know right. 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 <laughs> you know like i think it works this way that that insane person thinks it works this way right like um and yet the world like, the question is not entirely innocent either because the world is now as digital as it is <laughs> non-digital right yeah um, so it's so it's very disorienting yeah. uh and the like I say, so all of that portends that risk of so mishandling intergenerational transmission mm -hmm. at a critical juncture of civilizational crisis mm -hmm. that we basically incapacitate ourselves and spiral into civilizational collapse. Yeah, um, the worry is not so not so again. It's coming back to reality. Like the, for example, the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. The, the reason it's so intractable and difficult and it, it's so hard to believe that we'll manage to contend with it adequately is that the available capacity to deal with it is sort of debilitated by these these culture killing technologies mm. um so it's like mobilizing a response where we all with a shared reality um is one thing but mobilizing a response when we're lost in simulation is something else exactly um, and yeah so then the question of how uh to, to do that, how to reorient. Right, so this is the next question, reality. right? So tell me, how do we disarm the pedagogical weaponry? <laughs> um, in a, in uh, I mean, I think I think the, the first step is actually, and I say this to, to parents and teachers, the first step is to realize that we're actually in a dangerous situation yeah. and to take steps immediately to protect the most vulnerable people mm -hmm. who I think are children. So like, um, so that would be the first step. And that would even be how I would lead with policy 
change. Like this is a, you know, low grade ubiquitous child abuse that's taking place here. Right. Right. <laughs> child surveillance, and child manipulation. Um, and uh, so that'd be the first thing. And then the second thing would be to realize that the issue goes uh, deeper than even I have expressed here because I've been talking about kids, but it's also the case that um, election processes are disrupted, um, that uh, critical public health campaigns are, uh, you know, incoherent. <laughs> True. Uh, and back to what we, I mean, I, I, I get it. There's no simple solution, of course. And so, but the idea being that like, there's, there's something taking place here where the social media companies are debilitating democracies yep. and making it impossible for us to maintain the sovereignty of our own nation states. So they're running interference between the citizens yep. and the political apparatus with something that replaces the fourth estate mm -hmm. with like a for-profit behavior manipulation system. Right. And so that is driving us into increasing polarization mm -hmm. and increasing the likelihood of kinetic conflict, I believe. So the argument I'm making here is that we need the federal government, at least in the United States, to step in. Because uh, it's, a, it's effectively, how would you frame it then if it's not? It's a national it's security. Abuse, it's a national security issue, it's right? It's a national security threat. Like they are um, making it so that the basic principles by which our country claims to operate cannot be maintained. Right. Um, uh, and so it's kind of shocking to me that the, the United States federal government is getting played basically by Facebook, is unable to, to regulate it, right. um, but it should be regulated. And then the notion would be that the objective functions of Facebook and other social media companies should be uh, made into something like essential infrastructure and uh, de, uh, decommodified. Um, Do you mean nationalize? I mean, what we call nationalizing here? I don't know if you nationalizing the objective functions of Facebook. By objective functions, you mean infrastructure, or what do you mean? I mean the the nature of what the algorithm does right. <laughs> needs to be known by the federal government right. <laughs> and publicly available information to everybody. Okay. okay. Uh, and then the functions that Facebook fulfills that are truly important, communicative function, social organization function, mm -hmm. certain forms of low level local advertising, yeah. things of that nature, those need to be maintained in a, in a way that is in the interest of the nation, not right. in the interest of a small number of rogue technologists. Sure. Um, so the idea is not to regress back to something before we had this expansive yeah, digital yeah. infrastructure. It's, it's just a changing what it's for and right to, to to have the ability to regulate it basically right. um that it, it's a it's a kind of an infrastructure for profit thing that's gotten so out of control right uh and the concern is that we the government itself so when you have an infrastructure for profit thing that goes out of control like let's say fossil fuels mm -hmm. it's creating all these externalities but they're occurring thousands of miles away in the ocean with an oil spill the externalities being created by this one are in the minds yeah. of the politicians who are seeking to regulate it. And right. so this is one of the problems uh, that we are actually maybe not coherent enough as a government as a result of this thing to yeah. regulate this thing. It's like, um, a it's like a poison that is so powerful that you can't detect you've been poisoned sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the first step has to be something like psychoeducation that gets people to be like, whoa, right. <laughs> I've been borderline brainwashed by social technology for two years. Right. And of course, <laughs> the first reaction to that is the kind of this denial, if you like, to say it's really not that bad. It's just it's really not that bad. Well, what they say is it's really not that bad. It's only that other political side that's being brainwashed by Facebook. I'm actually getting the truth on Facebook. So, there, so there's, okay, <laughs> no, I know, I know that's how it goes. But then as your answer to that, again, a kind of education, is it, because um, that my side bias is a well-known cognitive bias, of course, um, and the projection onto the other side, what's the, what's the answer there? Like a public education program, like who, Someone has to lead this somehow. That's the idea is that we need to, yeah. it's one of the main linchpins of the meta crisis is the information ecosystem crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the main linchpins in there is something like broadly speaking in, in education, psychoeducation campaign that allows people, and this is some of what Tristan's been doing, some of what Consilience is trying to do, Tristan Harris, you know, where you're getting into 
just alerting people like yeah. you would an addict or like you would a cult member like hey these are the these are the five signs right. yeah. <laughs> that you are have a problem right yeah. and here's the way that indoctrination works right to put you in a trance uh, yeah. makes you susceptible to image right. ex exogenous image implanting like makes you reactionary and villainize other people um, it makes you prone to you know so like there's all of these things that we can list which if people would pay attention, they'd realize so, it's not just the other side that's getting manipulated by it's well, the power, everybody. Yeah, no, no, sure. But the parallel I'm seeing here is, you know, with the climate crisis, you can go back to maybe the 70s, give or take, and you have similar clarion, uh, alarm bells ringing, like this mm -hmm. might be a really big issue. And it's the sort of thing we should get ahead of because it gets worse and worse. And people are like, yeah, maybe, but it's a small group. It gets slightly bigger over time. And here we are like 50 odd years later, um, and P and now now the majority recognizes the scope of the problem, but can't quite figure out what to do with it. In this case, we don't have decades to lose, obviously. So there has to be some kind of accelerating function. Any idea what that might be? Um, not specifically. I mean, it's a good analogy, though. Like it's it's a similarly a common a problem with the commons yeah. um, and unintended externalities from accelerating technologies uh it's but it's the epistemic commons as we've called it right yeah, and yeah. what i would call it's the educational commons that we're actually extracting and strip mining the resources we need to do education and putting them into making fictitious capital instead right um but yeah the acceleration uh is rapid and again it's not it's not slowly building ecological devastation mm -hmm. it's rapidly induced confusion, attention yeah. dysregulation, polarization, mm -hmm. scapegoating, and other things that lock in as a result of right. social media addiction. So I, th I do think that, um, at, you know, the more awareness grows, and especially the more symptomatic the youth become as a result of overuse, uh, the more clear it will be. But um, the risk is that the solution uh, basically, the solutions could just simply foreclose on open societies. Right. Like, so one way to handle this problem is the way China's handling the problem, <laughs> which is just to radically centralize the nature of the internet and turn it back into something that functions a little bit more like broadcast, where there's just radical censorship and where you have, again, nationalized the objective functions and surveillance functions, right? Um, there's a way to reboot it that allows for open societies to continue to exist. Mm -hmm. um, at the consilience, we've been calling this the third attractor, that right. there's the attractor of authoritarian or oppression yeah. lockdown right. of the information environment. And then there's the kind of chaotic neo-feudalism that's kind of emerging in the yeah. United States. Both of those are self-terminating. Both of those will not last in the long run. Right. There's some third attractor which reuses the best of both of those from digital technologies yeah. to create a information ecosystem, a digital information ecosystem, a form of basically digital democracy yeah. uh, that um, kind of threads that needle, <laughs> you know, between complete chaos and rapidly escalating inequality and power dynamics and a small group owning all the algorithms and, or like a centralized state run mm -hmm. univocal mm -hmm. censored internet. Um, with you know uh, social credit scores and things, um, and that middle one, the third attractor, or it's not middle, but the third attractor, uh, sounds like it depends upon education. Like it's it for that believe. work. It actually it means creating. It's an education centric digital ecosystem. Right. So like if if you're a technologist listening to this, it's like the answer is like spend your time creating algorithms that optimize for learning and education mm -hmm. as opposed to creating algorithms that optimized for profit maximization and attention capture yeah and to be clear it is probably education and not learning in that context because it's education yeah, yeah. because you are speaking about cultural survival at some level rather than because learning could be what you want to further your own ends which may not be for the greater right. good of yeah so education centric yeah. algorithm creation um so you can imagine a dashboard where I am made aware of all the psychometric data gathered about me and my prior learning, and I can set my own learning goals and talk about how I want to have my data used mm -hmm. and create a customized educational 
uh, basically social media interface for myself, where the thing that's sequenced on my scroll or the videos that are recommended to me next are those which I would recommend to myself to optimize my own education, right. <laughs> or right. that would be recommended to me by a trusted elder or teacher, knowing the path that I'm on in particular areas of inquiry, right? Um, as opposed to the one next just being the one that's going to keep me watching, right? What that means is that people won't stay on site because it'll be more challenging. Yeah. They'll have to go away and learn and study and come back, <laughs> right? They'll have to have conversations. There'll be other things that take place because they're not just in a kind of dopamine reward cycle. They're in a challenge support um, you're actually learning cycle. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and so we're not looking at attention capture technologies. We're looking at actual education uh, and democratic communication technologies, yeah. um, which are, com are completely possible within digital. We just have not incentivized for them in uh, uh, basically the marketplace of, of digital technologies. Right. And the answer there, of course, as always, <clears throat> is political. I mean, you have to find a way of creating political capital for the combination of vast awareness raising and reg regulation and yep. design for educational purposes which means a change in the underlying philosophy of society yep. so like you know I, I, you know it's necessary you know even if it seems absurdly ambitious it, it, like you say it's not clear what else you're going to do right right um but the, the, the last question i have zach is just one that occurred to me while you were speaking there this notion of intergenerational transmission being central to education um, and in some ways, the culture is what we use to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, your work is so rich because it occurs to me that, you know, the, the idea of being in a time between worlds might problematize that relationship a bit. Because if it's the case that, you know, every generation evolves, but there's a kind of continuity of evolution such that the changes are of a similar magnitude it, across mm -hmm. generations. But when you get to a time between worlds, you're sometimes looking at very seismic changes in, in cultural reproduction uh, that are unrecognizable from the prior generation. So in that context, does it even make sense to say that what we need is to understand what the previous generation knew? What would you say to a young cynic who says, look, we're entering a different world. This is the world of the metaverse, it's the world of climate collapse. What you knew is just not that important anymore. Um, I've got to learn my own thing. You know, I'm going to, you know, see you later. I'm going to go on TikTok or whatever, whatever they'd say, but that kind of thing. And that, that's the answer there. And that's exactly right. That's why knowing that we're in time between worlds is so important for educators, because it is a very precarious time for intergenerational transmission, where a great deal can be lost right. and forgotten. And it is um, lost, just to be clear, like is the cynic lost. who says that that stuff's of no value, you're saying, no, wrong. This is what's allowed us to survive for hundreds and thousands of years. So what I'm saying is that, well, the best way I've, I know to talk about this is to actually use these categories of Margaret Meads. I don't know if we've talked about these from culture and commitment. We, 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 at some point, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Where she says, basically, you know, there's been three types of cultures. If you look anthropologically over the long historical record, there's been cultures where basically, and she calls them prefigurative cultures, mm -hmm. where what your father did and your mother did and what their father and mother did and their father and mother, basically the same as what you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> so you can just learn from the elders and maybe a little bit adapt, but not really. And then there's configurative cultures where the environment's changing enough that it's relevant what your parents did, but a lot you have to work out with your peers in conversation with the parents. There's a little bit of a rapider pace of change in the culture. Yeah. And then there's um, uh, post-figurative cultures. Um, uh, and no, wait, swap that. The first one's post-figurative cultures. Right. Right. The second one's configurative cultures. This one's prefigurative. Prefigurative, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. Post as in after what's gone before, gone yeah. with what's currently here, pre -anticipated. Pre meaning basically right. like we're in a situation where the environment's changing so rapidly right. that the world that will be inhabited by the children is so dissimilar from the world of the adults yeah. that the intergenerational dynamic changes yep. pretty rapidly. And, she, and this happens, she mentioned, in pre-modern you know, ancient times, if there was ecological destruction or warfare and there was refugee and there was movement mm -hmm. uh, where it's like, yeah, that worked for you guys when we lived a thousand miles away in the mountains. Now we live here uh, by the seashore. Um, so that notion that there are critical junctures when whole cultures have to change, when the relation between elder and student and uh, parent and child and that that dynamic shifts. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that there's no education taking place, 
what it means is that the type of education that takes place is is different mm -hmm. like the 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 um attentiveness to the experience and need of the child becomes more primary mm -hmm. listening to the questions that they have which you would never ask <laughs> mm -hmm. things more like um workshop models uh rather than standard curriculums mm -hmm. um and uh complex intergenerational arrays where you're not age grouping kids so strictly but you're allowing the younger kids to hang with the older kids in educational context with right. adults because what you need to do is create enough power and insight in the youth that they can basically uh step into the future in a way that we wouldn't be able to as opposed to the post-figurative culture where you can basically if you learn well enough from your dad you're all set <laughs> here it's, it's something like for prefigurative the kind of intergenerational transmission that happens is less at the level of content and more at the level of disposition or something like that mm -hmm. disposition and just the um so the adults are are stronger and have more power <laughs> and so there's also the the responsibility of the adult to create the safety container mm -hmm. in which the the new questions and perceptions mm -hmm. can emerge basically mm -hmm. so it's like there's a a midwifery there's a a creating a space where actual novelty can emerge from mm -hmm. youth um and so that is a response a teacherly authority responsibility different from the didactic teacher right. <laughs> is the teacher who creates the space for the youth to convene right. and fills it with the right resources right. and fills it with a certain wisdom and respect right because that's even the thing. that so even that kind of arena that you've described is the kind of thing that might be lost and people wouldn't even know they've lost it right yes correct yeah um and so in in these cultures where you have this prefigurative situation there's often a relinquishment on by both parties of the attempt to create educational relationships which so which is happening happen now yeah 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 and this is what you have is the basically the youth saying look at this you can't teach us anything the youth like you you know come on mom and dad like you messed up the world like don't try to tell me what to do and then you have the adults being like you're right kid i totally messed up the world i'm a failed being i have nothing to teach you well not um, just that but also it might just be it's not so much that i'm a failed being but i don't understand the world you're in yeah yeah mm -hmm. totally and so those and that's the risk is that actually that the invitation here is for more intimacy between right. generations in the face of mysterious reality right right uh but instead there's a withdrawal and a lingering resentment and fear i think so, of, so when you say make so when you say make education zach that's precisely mm -hmm. what you're saying like the love the, it's a kind of right. love right because it's yeah. make education is don't disengage allow the intergenerational transmission to happen recognize that because we're in this prefigurative cultural space between worlds that it won't be like it was in a in a post-figurative culture it won't be just me telling you this is how my father did it and how his father did it it'll be something more about here are the things that are of value to us here are the practices here are the norms right here are the stories these things you carry with you into the world that you're about to create Mm -hmm. even if it's unrecognizable to me those things will have some value and i believe that because i know it i know they have value because it's in, it's in, intrinsically valuable and it's obviously so self-evidently so um and then the children might go off and create a different world and i i don't know quite what that world will be uh, and it hopefully won't be TikTok, and it won't be some crude metaverse but it will be it could be unrecognizable but it doesn't follow that what we've taught them is is otios Right. Yeah. And, and also the handing on of the critical infrastructures, like, you know, we've built nuclear reactors. Those nuclear reactors need to be maintained for thousands and thousands here of you, years. Here you go, kids. Good luck <laughs> here you go, kids. Yeah. Right. And we've built massive sprawling bureaucracies. And oh. so there's a lot of stuff that needs to be handed over. And the way the handovers take place is very complicated when you have the situations that we're yeah. in. So, so yeah, so it, it is delicate. Um, and like I said, the, the first step is somehow making people aware that mm. in the context, we're already between worlds. Yeah. <laughs> like in that context, we don't even have places where we can try to attempt to create right. that novel emergence of new 
you know, culture um, and education. Uh, so yeah, de-escalate, <laughs> disarm, <laughs> disarm, yeah. disarm the pedagogical weaponry, make education not culture war. So um, for those watching this book, the chapter that Zach just spoke about is one of several great chapters in this book. It's a particularly good one. Um, the show notes will show you how you can buy the book. Um, thanks a lot, Zach, for first of all, for writing the chapter, uh, which was a fantastic piece of work, and for joining me today. And uh, look forward to talking again before long. Yeah. Thank you. See you. Bye bye.